Now we're going to get into some of the newer frontiers that we've been working on for the last two to three years. And so now you have to really open up your heads and be ready to move into the future. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next, this evening and all day tomorrow. And show you where science is really at at this point, the promise and how we're going to eradicate all of these problems that you see today that seem so overwhelming and the burden is so big that we no way can succeed. Well, that's not true. We're going to succeed by changing the paradigm of science. And so with that said, we're going to start tonight with Fear Creates Disease. And I just presented this recently here on Long Island. And this may bring you to understand a little bit more of why we've gotten to where we are. Why, in fact, uh, you and all of us, including myself, have become confused over the years. And slowly but surely, we've broken down our value systems to such a point that we accept total abnormality as normality at this stage. And this was a plan that I don't think it was a sinister plan. I think it was more so that the greed mongers got involved and slowly but surely we eroded the fabric of our culture, the fabric of who we were, where we came from. And because of that, we ended up in a circumstance where what we consider excellent today is at best fair to medium. What we consider normal today is totally, absolutely abnormal. And what we think is right is usually the opposite of what's right. And so with all of that said, what we're going to now talk about is going to let you understand why you're at that place, why our leaders now have been so uh, challenged and how they really don't understand at all what's supposed to happen and what their job is and what their role is and what real leadership means at this particular moment in history. And when you start to see these things, you start to realize that this was well thought out. Fear creates disease, as you see. And love heals all. Now, if you look at the one strand that has woven together everything we've discussed over the last 12 to 14 hours, it is really about you being without knowledge. And whenever we're without knowledge and understanding, we inherently and naturally, almost spiritually and biologically, become fearful. For instance, when you take a child, innocent mind, etc., put them in a dark room, and they can't see anything. They can't touch. They don't know where they are. It just sparks fear. And most of us, in a figurative manner, have been in that dark room, lost, confused, without any realm of realizing why we've gotten there and how we've gotten there. The way we were, the vast majority of time humans have lived on this green planet, we were nomadic and in total harmony with all other life. People did not fear that there was not enough. This was not a concept, because there was enough always. And no matter where they walked, no matter where they wandered, no matter who they were or what part of the globe they lived on, nature, God, if you will, the universe, abundantly gave what we needed. There was no fear. One of the great, most poignant things I ever read was actually written by a civilized Christian minister. Not a typical one that used the name of God to slaughter so-called savages. And rather than being prejudicial against the indigenous tribes, he got to know the medicine men and the chiefs of these tribes and was so enchanted with them and their cultures and how incredibly spiritualistic these people were that he learned some of their languages and actually wrote about what they said. And he interviewed a great chief medicine man that was observing the white people, the pale faces, as they used to call us. And they were completely confused as to the way we uh, lived. And one of the observations that I'll bring up to you is 
this chief medicine man was literally speaking to this minister and saying, we cannot understand, you know, we're sitting and plucking food from the trees, watching your fenced-in lands, that was a completely new concept to these people, that we would come, put stakes in the ground, put fences around, and on a year that the bugs came and ate the crop, or on a year it was so cold, we would then watch in the autumn, you bury your elders and bury your children from starvation as we plucked food from the trees next to the farms. They just couldn't figure it out. So you're going to understand what happened. When we became fearful individually and as a culture, we started to isolate ourselves from the abundance of life. And that's where the real problems began. The dawn of civilization. When our intellect began to supersede our instinct, insecurity rose, and we began marking territories and perceiving ownership. You only need to own when you feel out of control. Now let this sink in and get it. When you don't have you, you need stuff. You get that one? When you're not there. If you're there, you're all that you need. Because again, theologically, every great religious and spiritual philosophy through history, including Judeo-Christian theology, says we are made in the image of God. It doesn't hesitate on that. You hesitate on that because you've been taught that's sacrilegious. It's sacred. You are made in the image of God. And by the way, we do not need somebody else to be the vessel for us to reach God. You need to reach deep down into your heart and soul and access the God that's in you. But once you do not believe in that, when you don't have the strength, the inherent consciousness that you were born with, you start to say, I've got to create substance. I've got to create persona. And so you start to get the stuff around you and ownership and territories. And before you know it, the rise of industrial came. Those who developed the greatest intellect... Now remember, before this, it was the guy with the biggest brawn, the guy that worked the hardest, that was respected, the guy who had the biggest heart in the tribe, in the culture, in the community. That was the guy that was revered. And all at once, the Industrial Revolution was made, and the intellect became the leader. And this perceived leaders of the next phase in human development. They manipulated the farmers by offering dreams of grandeur and money to work in their newly created industrial capitals. So it was pretty easy. These greed mongers, the original greed mongers, basically went to the farms and said to the boys, how much do you make here on this farm a year? And they probably said back then $300 a year. And they said, well, you know, if you come into the city here to New York and work in my factory, you're going to have a great life. You won't have to sweat here on the farm and, you know, drag your body around all day long and you know, be poor, I'm going to give you $600. And they brought them into the cities, had them work 12 hours a day. They started at 11, 12 years old doing this. They dragged their poor wives in, put them in cubicles, and that's where the beginning of cities happened, really, in any significant way with the Industrial Revolution. As insecurity grew, the intellect became more and more important as far as our very weak culture was concerned. Then things got rough. At this exodus from the land drew millions into the newly created cities governed by the industrial elite. People began to question their very existence and purpose. Now the first generation probably thought it was pretty exciting to be in New York where they could go out and listen to music at night even though they lived in a a cubicle and were very upset and very unhappy and were all crammed in there like rats. But by the second generation, people started to get a little discontent. And they started to say, wait a minute, do you remember how nice it was back on the farm? We had gardens, we could walk around, there was fresh air. Because everyone 100 years ago was a farmer, except a handful of people. And everything, again, was organic. And can you imagine, there was no television, radio, sounds, airplanes going over your head, highway noises, pollution in any significant way. If you walked into the water right here in Long Island, It would have been probably, you could look down from a boat 200 feet. Totally radical different world. 
They were banished from Eden. That's how people started to feel. For the first time in human history, we left our roots and became isolated and awkward, propelling further dissolution from our instinctual spirit. Now remember, when I say this, I'd never write anything lightly. For the first time in human history, we left the earth. We had always been on the earth before, mostly as nomads, then finally as farmers. That's where the insecurity began. But now we're in cubicles in cities working for the intellectual elite and thinking, gee, it's a great thing. Now, people started to grumble around this time, second, third generation that they had done this with. And so they had to find a way to calm you all down again. And they realized that they couldn't do all the paperwork themselves. So they had to find white collar workers. So they had to establish something that you know very well here in Long Island called the middle class. Remember, there was not a middle class before. There was the workers and the elite. But they had to have this middle class, and they had to send you to school, even though they didn't like that, so that you could do the paperwork. Because as they made more and more money, they had to have more and more busy bee workers below them. And so that was a very clear plan. They weren't making enough, obviously, in industrial work, so they decided to create international corporation. Industries morphed into corporations and began global outreach, gathering the innocent flock into their sinister talons. And corporations, as you know, uh, through lobbying activity, uh, became people who you couldn't touch. Now, I don't know wherever we went wrong on that, but to call a corporation a person doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Now, it has all the rights as a person, but you can't effectively destroy it in any way, even if it's destroying you and the economy and the country and humanity. And we just saw that episode where they intentionally collapsed the economy. You think that was all just, whoa, it happened? And just yesterday, a report came out in Forbes saying the rich are richer. You know why? Because when you take stocks that cost $100, crash them, and make them $10, the guys with the money buy $10 stocks and make 10 times the money. And we've noticed this at Hippocrates. We pride ourselves on servicing every man, woman, and child on earth. So for people who are indigents, we have scholarship programs. For the elite from Madison Avenue who are used to upscale five stars, we have that for them. Because we are not people who are separationist. And we've noticed that our villas are packed and filled with people. And I'm sure, by the way, that if I charge double the amount of money, they wouldn't raise their eyebrows. I wouldn't do that. They wouldn't raise their eyebrows. And although we're filled most of the time, the ones that go the slowest now are the middle. So people are going into the low end and to the high end of Hippocrates. And how long did it take them to do that? Four years. Four years. I know you thought that just happened. It didn't just happen. There's a plan with all of this. Corporations became. Now they became international. They become, became untouchable. And a lot of you worked directly or indirectly for them. When you got really upset, they had to create the middle class suburbs. Because people said, that's it. I can't have another baby. I'm on my 10th. And we can't stick them into this ghetto in the middle of New York City. So what we have to do is make a little garden, a little land, even if every house looks the same, just to make them feel like they're out in nature. And where that happened is right here, the epicenter, and it was called Levittown. The very first cookie-cut suburb they created was right here. Does anyone know what part of Long Island that happened on? I don't remember. It was a place. Okay, so that is the original suburb they created. Again, a plan. There it is. So 10 minutes from where we're sitting right now. The epicenter of creating what we now call the middle class. Put a lollipop in your mouth. Now you can go out in the backyard, even though it's a cubicle about this big. You have some grass. You ever notice? You know, like these tenements in Brooklyn. I'm shocked. They're charging $2 million. You know, that's what, they're like tenements, but they moved them to Long Island. So you could see grass <laughs> out here a little bit. As generation passed, people became more comfortable living in confined entrapments, believing that someday they could attain the economic success and comfort that the corporate leaders dangled in front of their eyes every day 
And that's the mantra you started to learn about in kindergarten called the American Dream. The American Dream. They had word craftsmen then, by the way. As you see, the politicians today use word craftsmen. They make good guys the bad guys, bad guys the good. They were doing this a long time before you and I were born. These corporations became islands onto themselves that have successfully entrenched themselves in the government control in the entirety of the developed world. This is not an American phenomenon, this is an international phenomenon. Now the top bad guys we're going to talk about here. Now we have to give them their due rights. So I want you as good New Yorkers and people from the Northeast to clap for these devious, disgusting, unbelievably crazy corporations. So the most successful money makers in the world today. We're going to start with the number one deviant and that is the US oil and natural gas industry. They make about a trillion dollars a year. Let's give them a hand. These people give you fish that kill you. They give you polyester clothes and fire retardants. They give you pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. They give you oil you stick into your car and destroy the atmosphere. Every bad thing that you can imagine that creates disease, these people are the kingpins of that one. Haven't they done a brilliant job? They have done a brilliant job. And they've done a very, very effective job on getting you sick. Let's go to another deviant here. The war industry, let's give them a hand. These are the people that get you all patriotic. Wave the flag, blow smoke up your butt, tell you how wonderful it is to defend the country. You don't know why, but you're out there with the flag running. And what you're running for in Iran and Iraq is the oil industry and Halliburton. That's what you're running for. And anyone that would like to challenge me on this, I'll have a debate and I'll win it with you. So I can lead you right back to where the money comes from, who the people are that created this reality, and how it was planned during when. Not with his auspices, but by one particular American group during the Clinton administration. And it wasn't his administration that did. The Neo came in and realized they had to have a war, and it was actually announced to the Congress one year before 9-11. There was a fellow that they put eventually, because he got in trouble with his girlfriend, in charge of the World Bank. That was a big part of Baby Bush administration. And he literally stood in front of Congress a year before, called Wolfowitz, and said, you know, as imperialists, we need to go into the Middle East and take control of our oil, or the future of America stands in harm's way. But the Ameri listen closely to what he said, and access this if you don't believe it. But the Americans do not have sentiment for a war. We have to have an event that rivals Pearl Harbor to have Americans to live. With us now moving. Yeah. Us now moving into a Middle Eastern conflict. And so there you go. Um, that's exactly what happened. And the Middle East conflicts are going on. The longest war that America has ever been in in history is the Afghanistan war that maybe will be greatly over by next year. We've lost thousands of lives and killed hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq and Afghanistan. And if you want to call that patriotism, Ken, I call that shame. That's what I call that. And anyone here that calls yourself spiritual that supports such an endeavor, you're not. You're not. It's that simple. So these people are devious. The most conservative president we had in a hundred year period called Dwight Eisenhower's last speech, the greatest warrior of the 20th century. Congratulate him because he won a legitimate war. He and Winston Churchill called the Second World War. Was not given the credit. Young people were never taught that in the history books because they always like macho guys like Patton. But it was Eisenhower's quiet demeanor and instinctual intelligence that literally won that war along with Winston Churchill. And his last speech before he left the presidency was, you do not have to worry about communists, you do not have to worry about fascists, you have to worry about an American institution called the military complex, industrial complex. 
These are insane people that literally control even down to the gun lobbies. So when we kill seven and six-year-old and four-year-old and five-year-old babies, the next day we don't outlaw guns as they do in civil nations of the world. What we do is we debate whether or not it's really guns that kill people or mental illness. Well, if I have a mentally ill person without a gun, they're not going to kill me. And so anyone that would still debate that, something's wrong with your judgment. Then we get to the great pharmaceutical industry. Give them a giant hand. These are the people that have you on drugs you don't need. These are the people that make up diseases, and you agree that you have them. These are the people that put your children on cocaine for a make-believe, what is it called? We talked about it earlier, attention deficit disorder. Okay. And restless leg syndrome. And auto reflux disease. And in the book of psychiatry now, they have managed to name 750 diseases that they can't diagnose one of them. Because psychiatric disease in great part is made up. Again, you feel psychiatric, lost and out of control when you don't know who you are, where you're going, or what your passion is. Period. That's what a psychiatric disorder seems to be today. And they have been so successful with you because you're so unhappy out there today. What has literally happened is the number one drug prescribed now in the world is no longer antibiotics, which we talked about yesterday. What did we tell you about antibiotics? We, in fact, told you that most antibiotics that are prescribed are given to you for viruses, and they don't work for what? Viruses. So bottom line is, psychiatric antidepressants are the number one drug prescribed today. America, we always say we're number one. Give ourselves a hand. We are number one. We are the number one drug consumers on the planet Earth. We consume per capita double the amount of pharmaceutical drugs than any other country in the world. Number two, let's give the Germans a hand. They are number two. They consume one half per capita of the pharmaceutical drugs we have. Number three are the French and the Swiss. Let's give them a hand. Now what's really interesting, the largest manufacturing segment of pharmaceutical drugs is America, the second is Germany, and the third is France and Switzerland. I think that may have a little bit to do about the dispensary mentality. And do you think that these are the wealthiest countries you can imagine? They can't work very well on the Japanese because they still think. <laughs> you say, well, maybe I shouldn't have that stuff. <laughs> we say, oh, yeah, sounds good. Give me some more. And the number one psychiatric drug today is an opiate that they tell you is for pain, not for psychiatric, called oxy what? And did you see what Anna showed last night? That we have massive amounts of addiction from children being born because of their mothers being on opiates. And guess what? They turn their head this way, the pharmaceutical, because we sell 10 times more oxycodone on the street than we do out of the dispensaries of hospitals and doctor's offices. Don't you think they know that? If I know that, don't you think they know that? So they turn their head. Because if I can make 10 times more money by maiming people with a street drug that I wash my, I do a Pontius Pilate on. How many remember Pontius Pilate? Just wash my hands. <laughs> I didn't know anything. I didn't have anything to do with that. In my state, it was a dispensary for oxycodone. Matter of fact, they had to shut down doctor office after doctor. What is wrong with these doctors? Again, when they have no values, have no passion, have no life, money becomes their life. The same thing as the same leaders of these unbelievable sick organizations that we're now talking about. This group here, they admit in the New England Journal of Medicine, they admit in the British Journal of Medicine, they admit in JAMA that they kill 200,000 of us a year with their drugs. That's what they admit to. One of your fellow New Yorkers called Gary Knoll, used to have a brilliant chemist that worked for him, he passed on about three years ago, that I had about a three-hour conversation with, that he went out and showed me statistically that 750,000 Americans a year die from pharmaceutical drugs. That is three-quarters of a million Americans a year dying directly or indirectly from pharmaceutical drugs. How many of you have seen a loved one be in a hospital? 
for any period of time. And the result of that, shame on us. And shame on you, because the reality is we permit this. We consider this normality. And guerrilla marketing and fear marketing intimidates you so much that you're willing to do things that common sense do not even stand behind at this point. You know how many people I've know seen their loved ones die and they still go back into that death camp and ask for these things? There's a place for pharmaceutical drugs. I'm not saying never, but the overuse, misuse, prolonged use. Best example I had, it was a young man in my 30s. We had a woman come to us, young woman, reverse cancer, brain cancer. Goes back to California. Her father happens to be a general practitioner, very conservative, straight, notch guy. Is just so elated, called us up 100 times on the phone, radically changed his practice, no longer made prescriptions. Two months later, the hitman called the salesman from the pharmaceutical came in. He was naive enough, an older man in his 60s at that point, to tell the whole story. Do you realize my daughter had cancer, and she had brain cancer, and she was going to die, and she started to eat a good diet? So now I've been putting all of my patients on a good diet. Two weeks later, he was brought in front of the Board of Medicine of California, lost his license, because he was practicing legitimate medicine. Here we go, the meat industry, give them a hand, come on now. They're the ones that have you believe that you've got to slaughter animals and put their carcasses down your body to be healthy. Now let's say that slowly so maybe you get what you've been doing. That they've convinced you, they've convinced your mothers, they've convinced your grandmothers, that you've got to slaughter an animal when it's dead, then you swallow it. And somehow that's supposed to make you strong and healthy. Now does that make sense to you when you segment it and think about it in any significant way? And how they do it again is intimidation. When I was a little boy, the one thing I remember consistently being taught by the nuns I was taught by is about protein deficiencies. They didn't know what they were, but they were being told to say this. And how my manhood depended upon meat consumption. How many of the men that are older remember that? They actually would come right out and say, your masculinity depends upon how much meat you eat. So, of course, when you're developing your sexuality, when you're growing up, and I become a young man and a teenager and I have a couple of dollars in my pocket, we used to go out and have these undescribed, unspoken about meat-eating competitions. So we'd go to, like, to a steakhouse and we'd say to the guy, cook it a little bit. And then the next guy would say, cook it even less. And the third guy would say, don't even cook it. Right. Now, this is sick, but this is what we were trained to do. And then we would swallow this stuff that tasted like rubber, that was bloody. And we thought we would be masculine if we did that. The women were told, if you don't feed your babies and your husband's meat, they're going to die from protein deficiencies. Now, ironically, in the latest magazine, I write about that. Throughout history, we have evidence of the opposite of what's considered normal. In Israel, back a number of years ago, they had a major strike from the allopathic doctors, where they just had skeleton crews throughout Israel manning the hospitals and clinics. About two years after that, the statisticians looked at that time period and discovered there was a 75% decrease in mortality during the strike. Do you want me to repeat that or tell you what that means? 75% less people died when there was no health care. During the wars, I point out, where they have no meat or less meat and low dairy or less dairy, guess what? The mortality rates always, in every case, drop. Death rates drop. Again, Hippocrates, 57 years later, sickest people in the world and smartest people in the world come to us. They adapt this type of lifestyle, and thousands, tens and tens of thousands get well. How much evidence do we need? How much evidence? So here's a group that convinced you to take carcasses, eat them, drink the milk from animals, and somehow you think that's good. And this is a result. A recipe for disaster. Lacking fulfillment, passion, focus, and control, people have relegated themselves to perpetual consumption. So if you're not happy and you don't want to get on drugs starting with alcohol, then you start eating. That was my vehicle. I'm sure if I kept it up and food wasn't fulfilling, I would have gone to something heavier. And it's a way you squelch your feelings. You keep everything down here. 
And the more depth you put down there, the less you have to feel, the less you have to think. And you even do that with cooked food, vegan organic cooked food. The less life, the less stimulus it has in it, the less you have to feel. But man, you can really do it with meat that sticks in your body, fish, chicken, red meat, etc., for three days, never digest, and has to pass out, leaving behind unbelievable amount of noxious impurities. Now, here's the obesity trends in the United States of America. And this is a scary, scary, scary thing. We're going to start not that long ago. What year was that? I don't know what's really happened ever since 1968. Things have gone like that. How many of you relate with that? I talk to my old friends in their 90s. They say, you wait. They smile at me. So here we're going to take a trip now. Every year, watch what happens. Dark blue is the most obese and overweight people. Light blue a little bit less. Look at the statistics at the bottom. 
I don't know what happened in New Zealand. I think they get a lot of American TV reruns or something and commercials. And then Lotus down here, these people who have quite a different way of looking of life, like the Japanese and the Koreans and the Swiss and the Norwegians. Notice they're the least overweight, obese people. These people are also having a very systematic, controlled life that, by the way, they haven't lost their roots completely. When I used to live in Switzerland, it was so quaint, it was so polite, it was so nice. It's like living 100 years ago. Sure, it was modern, had a lot of weird things going about it too, but the fact was, it still had a structure and a culture that was non-existent in my country. So this is what happened, and this is what happens with fear. And when we don't have ourself, we need ownership, and if we can't control things around us because we can't get enough stuff, we make ourselves the big one. Follow? So the bigger we get, the less we have to feel, and we look like we're taking up space, and you've been taught by a very sick culture, the bigger you are, the stronger you are, and the truth is, the bigger you are, the least strong you are. And so this is what happened to us all. So understand, feel, don't feel as bad about this. AGEs are formed through two distinctive pathways. We're going to show you a new One unit is that is pathway more effective in diagnosing everything reaction. in the human body and the than other the best is tools the at the top hospitals in the United States and Europe. Pathway. Anyone who's legitimate now about biological health knows that everything comes down to AGEs. Ann Wigmore was explaining this without knowing how to articulate it to me in 1975. She said, if you put proteins and fats and sugars into the body together, the proteins and sugars will bond, the fats will clog and reduce oxygen, and it's going to create every biological disease you can imagine. She's right. It also creates free radicals, as you're going to see. When they bond together, what you literally see here is they start to come and create a whole new substance in the body that's not really natural biology. When you have enough of this going on, you see the free radicals come in, and that's the cause of all premature aging and disease. And what this leads to, and here's a very attractive woman here in Long Island that uh, you can tell she, sleep, she uh, shops at the Whole Food Market. Doesn't she look like a Whole Foodie? Very attractive. Now watch what happens, because she's eating all of the processed organic food there. You know, the organic chips and stuff. Oh, God, she starts to look a lot older, doesn't she? A little bit gaunt at that point. And she gets diabetes. But, you know, that's a chronic disease. You can never change that or correct it. Now, this guy gets a heart attack because he's just had a salami, organic salami, excuse me. That guy got Alzheimer's disease. This guy has ventricle problems over here. But they go to the holistic doctor and get chemical supplements pumped into their veins or chelation therapy. Because you know. the doctor, God forbid, would never tell them to stop eating salami since it's organic. You know. And so here are the free radicals getting into the platelets. And it starts to get into the tissue. And so this is how you affect the DNA. So your heritage is not what gets you sick. All of this mess starts to come and disbond and create inflammation. So what you see is an inflammatory response here, the combination of free radical damage, tissue mass invasion, and the kidneys start to go. Now, it used to be I saw kidney disorders very rarely. Now I'm getting commonly 30, 40-year-old people coming with kidney failure all the time because of this massive high-protein diet we're on, animal food diet, and massive sugar diet we're on that creates, again, AGEs. Now this, by the way, is a new film. It's only been around for three months. And I said, well, you know, how do we know all of this, and how does it become easy? So the guy says to me, you know, there's a unit that's in Germany, but unfortunately I can't get it out of Germany and sell it to anyone. And I said, I'm going to order it anyway. The day you can get it out, let me know. Even if we have to say it's a relaxation machine. Because you're going to see now in a minute how incredibly effective this unit is. Now when you have all of these problems, what ends up happening is that each and every one of these problems and abnormalities have frequencies, abnormal frequencies. And these frequencies systematically and systemically throughout the body start to come up with a relevant dimension of measurable electromagnetics. And if you put your arm on this $10,000 machine, it can not only predict what's happening now in your body, but what you can expect up to a decade in the future. Because it literally picks up the abnormalities, organs of the body, systems of the body that are breaking down and being degraded by what you're doing in your lifestyle. 
And it's going to show it here very easily. So it goes through the tissue mass, looks at the free radical damage along with the protein and sugars that stick together. And each one's frequency comes down, and it's monitored inside of this sophisticated system, monitoring system. And what we literally do is we see through this microscopic area these different colors, and then we can determine years and years in advance which organ system is going to be affected by which type of disease. Now, why they are not allowing this out of Germany at this point is because this would replace practically every single diagnostic tool in every single hospital on the planet Earth. And it would actually also tell us decade in advance or five years or two years in advance what you can expect so that you can now what? Avoid it. Make changes so it doesn't happen. So now you see where we're heading in medicine. We have a machine, not a machine, we have a computer program at Hippocrates now that in three minutes does a more sophisticated cardiovascular evaluation than the top cardiovascular center in New York City. It not only tells me what's going on in your cardiovascular system, but by the way, what chronological age your cardiovascular system is. And in these early stages, we've only used it for less than a year now, we're starting to recognize that people who have taken things like radiation and chemotherapy are dramatically advanced in age, not even in numbers, but or chronological age, but biological age, compared to people who haven't taken large amounts of medicines. So we're starting to reveal things that we weren't even looking for in that area. The dissolutionment breeds addiction. Loss and feeling estranged from success, people began consuming toxic non-foods like narcotics. That was me. I used to go to bed with food in my bed at night. You know, my favorite hangout with my grandfather was Carvel ice cream. May 15th, when they were bringing up the plywood on the side, he and I would hang out in his Chevy and Pal and wait until we could get the first ice cream cone. October 15th, as the plywood was going down, we were there getting our last ice cream cone. We used to go to Yankee Stadium, see Mickey Mantle, not to see them, but to get the hot dogs. I mean, here I'm, right here, and back in those days, no pretense. Roger Maris, Joe Pepitone, Whitey Ford, Yogi Berra, all of them were there. We're watching, and I'm chewing on sour crate hot dogs. Can we have another one, Grandpa? <laughs> Dissolutionment. Your little joy is food. Can you imagine we're so reduced to that, that food is what gives you joy? This is why we have two or three 24-hour day food channels. They prepare food. <laughs> the end result is this. I remember years ago, my colleague and friend Dick Gregory called me up. Insane genius. This guy is nuts, but a genius. And he said, Let's take care of some fat people. So I think, okay, there'll be fat people like I used to be, 300-pound people, 200-pound people. First guy he finds is in New York. He's 23, and he weighed 1,200 pounds. I said, Dick, when you do something, you do it. I said, you've got to be bullshitting me. This guy weighs 12. He hasn't walked out of that damn place for years, he said. And it was true. We had to send carpenters in to knock the frame out of his door to get him out, bring him down in the freight elevator, Back then, Eastern Airlines was in business. We had to buy three chairs, bring them through the crate in the back, sit them down, and drag them to the Bahamas. He couldn't walk, by the way. And when we used to stand him up, he had one to two feet of fat that hit the ground that would drag behind him, like this. And I sent a guy down out of Hippocrates to the Bahamas. Dick somehow convinced the government there. He said, let's create the Bahamian diet. And <laughs> sent him down. And what we did is put powdered greens into a container and got them off anything else but powdered greens in water, and had this guy for six hours a day walk in the ocean. We'd put buoyancy around him. And he went down to 300 pounds. It didn't end up pretty. He came back, started to take drugs, broke up with his girlfriend, died. When he died, he was 700 pounds. They had to bury him literally in a Steinway piano box. You know, the box they put around a Steinway piano. The bottom line is, this is what happens. To recap, negative thoughts and fear will strip your power making you an easy target for seduction by the nefarious forces we've just discussed. So they're pounding on you. You don't know who you are. Don't take any. I can't take any more. Let me eat. Let me eat myself to death. I won't jump off the Washington Bridge, but let me eat myself to death. Now that's what you can do with weight, or this is what you can do with weight. So we just had the Olympics. I want to give the British a hand. They did a wonderful job. 
even though Romney went over there and criticized him. I think at the end it turned out good, didn't it? Bottom line is, here's a, a fellow New Yorker. He's since passed on, but his name is Chamoy. The power of positive thought versus the last guy you saw transcends matter and provides endless energy. This truth is illustrated here by Chamoy as he bench presses one of his lighter weights of 1,000 pounds. The Olympics, the strongest men in the world were lifting 700 pounds. I will repeat, this is one of his lighter weights of 1,000 pounds. This is the power you have if you use the God within you. This is the power you have when you take responsibility for your life. This is the power you have when you access everything that's available to you. But what he really wanted to show off one day, he said, oh, that's wussy stuff, 1,000 pounds. So we went to 7,063 pounds. This is the actual picture. And notice he has, with one hand, over 7,000 pounds, three inches off the plate. Now, some of you probably think this is make-believe. But those of us that are conscious realize that this is not make-believe. That there is nothing you are incapable of. I learned that starting in my 20s when I'd watch people come to us, I'd look at blood tests and say, this person should be dead. And now I know them 30, 40 years later. They're friends, and they're running around, they're as healthy, if not healthier, than I am. The power of positive thought. Norman Vincent Peale had it together. He got it. He understood it. So did a guy called Jesus Christ, so did a guy called Moses, and the list goes on and on. So did a guy called Martin King, so did a guy called Mandela. On and on the list goes. There is nothing that stops you once you realize that you have the power to do anything you want to do once you have the commitment and conviction to do what you love. What stops you is you. We talked about this. I don't want to labor over it. The most powerful doctor in America pulled the pants down of corporations and showed you they're putting drugs in food. It's not enough you're addicted to the sugars, fats, and salts. It's not enough you loathe your life, and so you just eat to sedate yourself. Now they actually put additional addictive substances, like opiates, into your children's food and your food. So you continue to go down. They consider you nothing more than consumers today. They don't consider you human beings. They have no respect for you. They don't care how poor you are, where you live. If your children die in these wars they make up to protect oil, they don't care a thing about that. A recipe for a toxic addiction. Chemical flavorings are another essential weapon in the arsenal of the food industry. The term that is used to describe this as criminal practice is hyperpalatability. They have conventions every year where these insane scientists come together and share formulization of how they'll put further addictive substances in the food. When he asked Wolfgang Puck what happened, he said, without prompting, sugar, fat, and salt, people can't get enough. But now we have to add a fourth thing in there, dope. Sugar, fat, salt, and dope that you're paying for. A dangerous combination. Today, people fear-driven consumption is accelerated by the international addiction brought forth by the manipulation of food. When they took cocaine out of Coca-Cola, they realized that it was much too expensive to use that, that they could put eight tablespoons of sugar in. It was as addictive, if not more addictive, than cocaine. I know the hardest thing. When I gave meat up, I loved it, but I gave it up. When I gave dairy food up, it was a little bit more tough. When I gave sugar up, it was impossible. Impossible. I mean, I know what a heroin addict feels like, I guess. Because I was an addict. How many of you relate to that? And what most of you do is you change the channel, you don't throw away the TV. You say, oh, I don't eat sugar. I take 10 gallons of mango juice a week. You know. Oh, I don't eat sugar. I eat agave syrup or xylitol. What do you think all of this is? It's sugar. You know. It's like saying, I'm not a drug addict because I take methadone. <laughs> Come on. You're a drug addict. Until you realize you're an addict, you don't change. And again, the half-baked health food industry 
and the raw food groupies, cheerleaders that don't know what they're talking about, are going to tell you things that they make up on the spot. They're like the F channel again. They make it up as they go. Oh, agave, raw agave syrup. There's no such thing as raw agave syrup. 100% of it is cooked. It's 180 degrees minimum they cook it. When it was tested by two independent laboratories, it was shown to be more problematic with blood sugar than high fructose corn syrup. So if you want to get low blood sugar or diabetes, knock yourself out with raw agave syrup. Xylitol, if people say, oh, I don't take sugar, I take xylitol. Maple syrup is 65% sugar. This is from a birch tree, it is 68% sugar. The body doesn't say, oh, here comes expensive xylitol. It says, here comes sugar. I'm happy, give me sugar. You know, and so I was really brave and smart. I gave up all of that stuff, and I took up eating 30-pound watermelons. <laughs> Another good way to get sugar, isn't it? When I was really semi-conscious, I used to polish off four or five, six times a week, half gallons of Tropicana orange juice. One fell swoop, man. That wasn't down in three minutes. My name wasn't Brian. That's because I was smart enough not to take processed sugar. You follow what I'm saying to you? Then I really got smart. So I started to eat pasta, potatoes, and bread. So I gave up all sugars. Then I took up one loaf of bread, which converted in 20 to 30 minutes to sugar. When are we ever going to stop the sugar thing? When I admitted I was an addict. When I admitted it was a problem. When I admitted that I was con consuming to squelch my true feelings when I didn't want to observe who I really was and the bullshit I was pulling off. Then I finally said, hey, I've got to change this as hard as it is. But it's hard to change anything until you change you. That's the problem. One of my good buddies here, I don't know him at all, but I read everything he writes because he's a good down-to-earth guy, out of Harvard, psychologist. His, my favorite book out of 650 I've read on brain and new brain chemistry, wonderful stuff, was the user's manual of the brain. Great if you want to learn about modern brain research. Recently he came out with this book called Spark. John Ratte, professor of psychology, revolutionized our understanding of the maladies caused by sedentary lifestyle in his new landmark work, Spark, the revolutionary new science of exercise in the brain. Amazing stuff. You know, I always think I'm up to speed on this stuff. Then I read these books and say, my God, I didn't know any of that. And this was one of those things. I said, holy macaroni. And one of the most important things he wrote about here, out in the Midwest, in an upscale, middle, upper middle class area, all white kids, all great school systems, good, well-paid teachers, good curriculum, good literature they're reading, they were failing as Americans do in science and math. Now, they had a superintendent of schools in this district, I think it had 18, 19,000 children in it, that was smart. He said, wait a minute, I have great teachers, I have great curriculum, I have great books, great facility, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put gyms in and make it mandatory that everyone works out vigorously as if they're on football teams and athletes, and we're not going to let these kids sit down. Now listen to the results of this. In this school district, with 19,000 children, to elevate itself as number one in the world in science. The only thing they changed is exercise, and they went from a failing school district in math and science to the number one, not in the United States, but in the world. They beat Korea, they beat Japan, and they beat China. How important is exercise? Women who consistently exercise reduce their chances of developing dementia by one half. Maybe this should be the second thing they talk about on national news on a nightly basis. Do you think so? Imagine if you can say, we can save the brains and lives and the families of millions and millions of women in the United States. If you only do one thing, exercise on a regular basis. But no, you'll never hear a word until you come to one of these seminars with me. And basically, your mother may not know who you are, may not know who your father is very soon. The evidence is incontrovertible. Aerobic exercise optimizes our brain for peak performance. I explained depression to you before. Engaged brains promote leading roles for dopamine and norepinephrine in regulating the attention system. This is a broad scientific explanation of how exercise defeats attention deficit disorder by increasing the neurotransmitters. The most interesting fact is that this happens immediately. 
altering the consciousness of the attention deficit sufferer. Took 1,000 people, put them on a treadmill for one hour, did MRIs in their brain before, MRIs after. Not one person had any symptomology of attention deficit disorder. 60 minutes later, aerobic exercise, their brains no longer had any indication they had so-called attention deficit disorder. That is 100% success by what? By exercise. By exercise. If you haven't read this book yet, you better get it. Get cozy tonight. Get cool. Because why Anna Marie and I wrote this book is we got tired of sexuality being hijacked by religious fanatics, by Puritans. Now, the one thing that I've learned in my 60-some years of life is that the most important drive that we have is a sexual drive. Now, that doesn't mean we run around wanting to have sex all the time. That was me before I was 30. That's true. But it means that there is nothing you do, no act, no thought, no motivation or no move that you have that doesn't have some sexual undertones to that. And that's not dirty. I'm saying it's driven by sexual hormones. And by the way, when you're 100 years old and you know somebody's coming over to your house that you know or your loved ones or your family, while you sit in front of a mirror and comb your hair and put your favorite dress on, it's because of sex hormones driving that. You don't get away from this, people. The underlying factor in every thought, every action that you will ever have in your life has a sexual foundation to it. Now, with that said, does anyone want to challenge it? I'd like you to challenge it, because this is biology at its truth and best. But Puritanian ideology and religious fervor and stupidity basically made sexuality dirty. I don't know what's dirty about sexuality. Matter of fact, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for sexuality. Can you imagine how boring your life would be if you weren't attracted to somebody else? Can you imagine how weird it would be if you didn't flirt? Imagine how mundane life would be. It is a healthy thing if you consider it healthy. It is a scary thing when you try to suppress it. And that's what happens when we have rape and murder, and a lot of these other things happen when you tell people it's bad to be normal. In this country, we're having a healthy debate for the first time on homosexuality. I don't know anyone who really is an aware person who would condemn a homosexual. How dare these people say we're going to cure homosexuality? That's like saying we're going to cure this building from being a building. That will not happen. And just like the women and just like the black people had to go through their time, let's hope it's time that we allow the homosexuals to be our brothers and sisters and hug them and kiss them and love them and accept them no differently than you will anyone else. Because homosexuality is not taught to you, it's a biological factor. I think I really learned that best about 20 years ago we had a, a lovely couple who were really in love, just like Anna and I are, uh, two men, and they were dying of AIDS. We thought they literally would die when they were at the Hippocrates. And they unfortunately took the one room we had at that point that was upstairs. And I would watch them go up the stairs, and I almost, it broke my heart. They would walk two or three steps, and they would hug each other because they were almost falling down, and they'd have to breathe for a minute, and then walk up another two steps. And now I go to the gym and work out with one of them. And I said to him one day, a number of years ago, tell me when you knew you were homosexual. He said, well, I'm, he's younger than me. He said, the Beatles were really, really popular. And he said, I kept going to my grandmother when I was two and showing her Paul McCartney's picture and saying how cute he was. And I said, what did your grandmother say? She said, you can't think he's cute. Don't think he's cute. And he said, I realized being perplexed a little off when I was three years old. I couldn't figure out. Everything I liked, everyone told me I couldn't do. And he said, when I was in high school, I got buff. He said, nobody else was lifting weights then, but I got buff. And I used to go out in cars with my other buddies, and we'd beat up homosexuals. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no. He said, I couldn't take my feelings. I had to suppress who I really was at that point. This is what happens when you suppress. The thing that you are driven by is sexuality. So we had to bring sexuality out of the darkness, out of the closet, bring it up and talk about it as a scientific biological fact rather than some mystical thing that we do just to have babies or we do for pleasure. When I was a boy, I knew something was wrong. Because if I lied and said I had, because I was lying, by the way, that I had sex with a girl, I would have been a hero. Oh, my God, that's great. Guys would hit me on the back. But if a girl said she had sex, she would be considered not a hero but a whore. So by the time I was 12 years old, I realized something was wrong with that picture, don't you think? If she wants the same pleasure, 
same intimacy as me. She's bad, but I'm good. I'm heroic for that one. We've got to change, people. Your fear makes you sick. And one of the major reasons people get sick, along with everything else we've talked about, is suppressing their sexual feelings. I can't think of a better way. We know directly in this book we talk about ovarian cancer and suppression of intimacy. Prostate cancer. Every man that comes to me with prostate cancer, I write on a prescription pad when they have a good sense of humor, sex every day. They said, oh boy, I can't wait, doc, to get this home to my wife. <laughs> Why? Because what we know, the more you have, the less prostate and the quicker it goes away. A perfect storm appeared when we succumbed to the unnatural and man-created fiascos of material disillusionment, corporate manipulation of our food supply, and lethargia that these pseudo-luxuries encourage. Our personal self-sabotage places the cherry on the cake of our inevitable, painful, perceived destiny. Thanks so much. This is a good key. He's persistent. God bless him. I'm going to shut up soon. Remember, I'm Irish. You have to take that into account. Our natural connection. As humans, we were once a thread woven into the tapestry of the planet and universe. We gained our strength, confidence, and passion from the entirety of all life. You get that? We were a very important thread in the tapestry of life. Strong, healthy, part of, fulfilled, universal, loved, godly, spiritually aware, conscious. Now we're like the thread blowing in the wind, not knowing what direction went. Because we are independent of everything else. We are so bright. We are so smart. We are gracious. We are everything we're not. Without this connection, we reached out to create substance out of nothing, resulting in our own personal and human destruction. Here's my good friend and colleague, 97 years old, Valerie Hunt. In 2011, I got really cocky for about three days and said, I'm going to write my own, on my own, the new biology. After I realized I didn't know enough, I called her up. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. I said, Valerie, how dare I think I could do this on my own? I have a big gapping lack of knowledge in certain areas. Now, Valerie became the very first woman ever hired by the University of California educational system. And I said, why did they hire you? Reluctantly, they didn't want women there. It's 1948. And she said, they had to hire me. She's really a funny woman, smart as can be and down to earth. And I said, why? And she said, I had three PhDs when I was 27. I said, how do you get three PhDs? She said, the first two bored me. And she became the woman that created what we today call the field of biofrequency medicine. So why she is my cohort and partner in writing the new biology is she started to think about this when I was born. And she has done decades of understanding this. She is putting together the next generation at this point of diagnostic and therapeutic devices that will go beyond the cyber scan and go beyond the undermed and go beyond the things that we're now employing, which is cutting edge. And it's going to be a unit like this that will have little units that will look similar to what I have in my pocket here. Not, of course, for the same purpose. So when we discover what disorder you have, we actually program these units and they get onto your body and you sleep with them and everything else. And we intense intentionally believe that this is going to happen within this year, that we're very close, that this, this type of technology is being produced as we sit here today in Palo Alto, California. And we're very close to breaking that, the new paradigm. My colleague Valerie Hunt, three decades ago, filmed the disparity between death and life. Only in this case it shows how we choose our course of action or future by consuming that which resonates with our consciousness. Now, I know we can't do this normally with the lights, but can somebody help me and put all the lights off? Because this is a fragile film. This is well before we had digital film, and I want you to see it as best as we can. So this is what she did in California more than 30 years ago, back in the 1980s, early 80s, late 70s. And it took her a long time. You know, she's always thinking way ahead of everyone else, so she has to find people that can catch up with what she's talking about. So first, we're going to see a man eating the typical Western diet here. So look closely at what you see. He's eating a hamburger, a French fry, a soda, and of course, a Mr. Good Bar. <laughs> now, notice the electromagnetic frequency around him. 
Every time he swallows, and his Adam's apple goes up and down, there's a decrease in the electromagnetic frequency around his body. And by the time he finishes this, there is no protrusion of electromagnetic frequency. You see, it just went down about an eighth of an inch there. Because death begets death. Ten minutes later, after drinking a quart and a half of water, we put him on raw food. He's been eating it now for three minutes. You see a little bit of a difference between his electromagnetic frequency? What you're now seeing is the state of the art of science of nutrition. And every time he eats, it protrudes out an eighth to a quarter of an inch more. Notice that? Just spiked up. But it's not only food, it's a universe. And it's our interconnectedness that now in science, we no longer have to call the spiritualistic mysticism. We're going to call it modern cutting-edge science. Now we're going to go to the ocean and look at the person's body and energy connecting with the waves. This is why many of us love the ocean or love the mountains or love to commune in nature or go out into your backyard because that energetic connectivity is the 75 hertz that every cell in a healthy body has and you're gaining that not only from food but through energetics in nature itself which is probably working at that 75 hertz if it's balanced. Now we get to some really interesting ones where control of the head and the mind, etc. Here we have out in nature in the mountains of California, about half an hour outside of Los Angeles. And you see a guy just resting. He's not meditating, not praying, he's just resting there. And notice his energetic field connecting to the atmosphere and the environment around him. Now, as he sits and he relaxes more, do you see a dramatic increase in the electromagnetic frequency? As he looks at nature, see that it wanes and comes back again. This is really beautiful to show you children are much more advanced than we are. So here's a father sitting there relaxing. Watch the child and look at where, out of the crown of his head, the energy comes from. Child's running around the father. And as he gets closer to the father, watch the electromagnetic energy increase in the father. Do you notice it? Every time the child gets closer to the dad. Isn't that beautiful? This is why we love babies. You could take an axe murderer, show him a baby, he's going to melt. Because babies have the epitome of godlike energies. This is my favorite of all, and I've threatened now we're going to make new films on this with digital in the next couple of years. Here's a mother, she's going to pray. She's a Christian, and she's going to bring her child together. They're going to sit in prayer now. Now watch what happens. This is dynamic, and even without digital, you're going to see a radical difference in this. So when Benson at Harvard back in the 70s tried to challenge meditation, prayer, and contemplation, he became the largest advocate scientist in the world for it because it connects you in a way with the universe that nothing else does. I just spoke to a minister that was here this week, and I said, do you know the work of Larry Dosey? Larry Dosey was a skeptic, tried to disprove Christianity had any effect on health. Now became the number one advocate, medical doctor in the world, to show you prayer heals. And we now have the science that how prayer heals. Over the last six decades, we have been helping people find their way back to themselves by empowering them with living, raw, vegan food. The inherent natural way that we're supposed to maintain the electromagnetic frequency of the body is through living food. Understand that. It is not first and foremost the nutrients in the food, as we started last night. It is first and foremost the electromagnetic frequency in the food. This not only elevates the ability of their entire body system to function at maximum level, it also sparks consciousness, helping the person to normalize. Now, how many of you here have really, truly adapted the Hippocrates diet fully? Raise your hand. How many of you realized what happened to you consciously? Didn't it freak you out? It sort of forced me to think and have feelings and have compassion. I felt really odd at first. I had never felt as open, as happy, as spiritually inclined as I was in my life, it felt abnormal for me. It really did. And so even if you don't attempt to become conscious with this, the food will provoke you to be conscious because it puts you at that frequency that makes consciousness occur on a hormonal 
and neuron level. From now on, science must relinquish its previous dogma and embrace the power of universal connectivity. This is it, the end of the baloney. This is when we go from biology to quantum biology, from physics to quantum physics. Now here's where I'll speak about what we discovered by 2003. Nassau didn't go out and intend to do this, but they finally supported the quantum physicists who show us that there's multiple universes. Now let me explain what I'm talking about. And this is exciting, especially for you that are on the fringes. You're going to realize that some of this new age stuff you're talking about has some teeth at this point. Most of it's mystical bullshit, but this has teeth. That we have a concept that there was a big bang, and it banged and exploded, and we started, and that was the end of the universe. That was it. It was a defined, limited universe. The flights they did in 2003 went out and started to film the edge of our known universe. And for the first time, what we saw and measured and confirmed is that that bang happened, but it didn't stop. And as we got to the edge of the universe, we showed that the particles speed up and speed up and speed up and speed up. So today, the term that's really used in legitimate physics is the multiple universes. Now, what is exciting, and I don't know enough about this to articulate it well, is that when I speak to the people who live with this, breathe it, teach it, I spoke to a guy out in Stanford recently, blew my mind. He said, what that means is that there's multiple worlds like we have, almost mirror worlds. And the differences we may find now or in 200 years are that it's going to reflect but the opposite. Gravity is going to do the opposite of what it does on this planet. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no. He said, you think we're having fun now. We've got to survive our stupidity so we really start to have fun. Survive our stupidity. I laughed my butt off when he said that one. I said, you're right. He said, none of us are smart, but we've got to be open to understand that. And if you know you're not smart and open to understand new things, you're going to have a lot of fun. If you think you're smart, you're in trouble. It takes a big burden to try to maintain smart. Because maintaining smart, nobody knows what smart is. You're going to have to work hard on that one. What you have to maintain is compassion for life. That's all you have to maintain. If you have that, everything works. So here's some examples for you. Here's a young man. Typical, typical hard case, and ends up with stage four melanoma. One thing we know about stage four melanoma, it is a death warrant, as far as allopathic medicine is concerned. I've seen so many page people stage four melanoma reverse, it's a joke. But in mainstream medicine, they have zero success with this. By chance, about 5% are misdiagnosed and survive five years. 95% will be dead, of which Within a year of diagnosis, 80% 80 of, 80 of them will be dead. Okay? He has it, but he's an engineer. Damn it, he couldn't have been an artist. Artist I can convince, he's saying. Engineers, forget it. Well, tell me exactly the mathematical formula of how this food is going to work for me. I said, get over it. Can't get over it. If I don't understand how it's going to make me well, I can't do it. You follow me? A cerebral paralysis is what I call that. So I said, look, you're going to die. That's OK, die. But don't bother all of us in the process of dying. I said, all you do is you, you drain a lot of energy from all of us. You want us to tell us something we don't understand. But what we do know is people get well. So he really got it because he realized he was going to die and he was young. And up in Toronto, where he lives, we made sure he started to see people who had a real inkling to understand true and honest, authentic spiritual consciousness. And all at once, he started to have an aha moment. He said, oh, wow, now I understand why I got sick and why I was really preparing to die and why I didn't believe in myself enough to think I could recover. Now, when he got sick, I did convince him because this was technical enough. <laughs> this is when he had supposedly five days to live because they wrote down on a piece of paper up in Toronto the exact day he would die. Wasn't that nice of them? And he carried it around in his pocket. Can you imagine this engineer? Well, look at this. We've got to work hard because it's only two weeks I have. <laughs> two weeks I have. I said, well, you know, you've got to come back and see me tomorrow. I'd say, <laughs> even if he was supposed to see me, I'd say, I'd cancel it. And it would freak him out even more. And I kept saying, come on. I'm going to stretch it. I'll give you another day. I'll give you 13 days, I'd say to him, or 14 days. 
He's getting more and more nervous. As you see, this is Benjamin several years ago in the grips of disease. Note the lack of biofrequency admitting from his body and consciousness. So about a year ago, I was up in Toronto. He's completely well. He became a health educator, went through Hippocrates, is teaching this now, helping to save lives on a daily basis. And I said, why don't we do another one of these photographs? Here's Benjamin today, seven years later. You notice a little bit of a difference with him? Now what you're seeing here, this is a little crude because we haven't the technology yet. In four to five years, we're going to have the technology. One of the best diagnostic tools you're going to have is what you see up here today, measuring biofrequencies at this level. But there is a distinct difference between this guy who looks like he's dying and about 30 years older, and this guy who's 30 years younger, and the electromagnetic frequency that surrounds and embellishes his entire body and his head. Now for me, we consider Hippocrates the anti-hospice movement. Because when people are serious, they don't want to die, they come to Hippocrates. And so I want you to visit with a few of these people and just give you a sense of what I've been, thank God, dealing with since I was a boy in my 20s. It has been a gift from God. I bounce out of bed every day, seven days a week, and thank God for what I have. That I have give, been given an opportunity to see humanity at its best to see the power of spiritual increment once you use it, to see how simple the entire formula is, that none of this is complicated. Here's Samantha Young, pancreatic cancer, stage four, prevalent in all of her body, four organs it had moved to. That is a death sentence. She came into my office 21, 22 years ago, said, you know, they said I'm really sick, but I don't want to die. I said, why don't you want to die? And this is a question I often ask people who are hinging on this. I say, well, you know, I have five daughters. They said, that's not enough. I said, what, you want to stay alive to be a mother? They'll survive without you, I said. He said, well, that's not very nice what you say. I said, no, maybe not nice, but it's the truth. It's not enough to tell me you want to be alive to be a mother. Well, I want to see my grandchildren. You know, I'm going to have a grandchild. I said, now tell me, when you get to the point where you're going to tell me what you want to be alive for, let me know. And she stopped and she said, I never thought of that. She said, you know, my, my husband left me when I had my fifth child. She said, I've been a, the mother and father, and my whole life has been those children. And what I want to be is loved, and I want to keep giving love. And I got up and I hugged her, and we cried together. And here it is, 21, 22 years later, she's completely well. You've got to find out what you are, who you are, what you want to be. If this is all I dealt with, I'd be bored. I'd have to turn the keys of the Institute over to somebody with less interest. Chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, all a joke, not a disease. A retrovirus that goes into the muscle of the body once the immune system is strengthened as everything. We are monofocused, single-minded, everything we do. When we send you to our psychotherapist, it's about your immune system. When we put you in electromagnetic cold laser, undermed therapy, cyber scan, H-way therapy, Biofor therapy, gemstone therapy, it's about your immune system. When we give you raw living food, it's about your immune system. You follow me? When I tell you to exercise, it's about your immune system. Everything is about the immune system. There is no hidden secret here. The hidden secret is the only way anyone will ever get well in the history of humanity and have is strengthening the period. Don't let anyone ever lie to you. This bullshit they tell you today about autoimmune diseases, whenever you hear them say there's an autoimmune disease, there's a real clear indication. They don't know what it is, so they throw it into that category. There is no such thing as an autoimmune disease. There's unhealthy and unhappy immunities. Why? They should be unhappy. Think about how you've been treating them. You haven't been sleeping enough. You've been living in this cesspool world we talked about today, shoving stuff down your throat that's not food, that's noxious, being negative, not exercising enough, draping your body in polyester plastic, Living in New York, <laughs> you follow me? If your body didn't go on strike, it would be out of its mind. Do you follow me? So it just goes on strike. Doesn't mean it's broken down and your immune system's attacking you. Do you realize if that were a factual statement, if your immune system attacked you, you'd be dead in three to five minutes? Now why would your own body's immune system attack you? That's a stupid way because they look down and loathe you and think of you as non-intelligent to describe that to you. Your immune system doesn't attack you. 
You've attacked your immune system. That's what they should say. That's an honest statement. Now, by the way, if you start to get the immune system to trust you, and in my case, that took a long time. That took decades. Can you imagine my immune system? I never ate a piece of food in my life. Smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. Ten years straight, every day I smoked grass. My highlight in my life for about ten years, I played in nightclubs. I couldn't see the guitar player two inches in front of me. That's how thick the smoke was. My favorite activity was being angry. <laughs> Think about this. And I was fat as a goose. Well, goose were a lot thinner, by the way. I was as fat as a moose. Forget a goose. Look at this guy. He had obesity, cirrhosis, hepatitis C, diabetes, and he was on his way to a liver transplant. Ten years ago, running around now. Last time I heard he was sailing in Hawaii. I said, where is he? They said he never knows. He goes from one island to another sailing. Cervical cancer. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. One of our nurses, Tom. How many of you remember Tom when you were with us? Love Tom. Tom came to us 10 years ago. He had stage 4 lymphoma. Dying. They said, well, we've done everything we can. We're not sure, Tom, you have any more than a few months to live. Go home, get your affairs in order. He was a 20-some-year-old boy. Get your affairs in order. Thank God Tom is a Midwesterner, pretty smart, down-to-earth guy. <laughs> Gee, you know, I'm not ready to die. Very low-key. You know how the Midwesterners are? I mean, doesn't sound like I want to die. Big, tall guy, balding. So he came to me at, at the end of Hippocrates. He said, what? I want to be with you. So this is an easy place to do this. And well, you know, I don't need you to just hang around here and tell me you're sick. I said, you know, if you really wanted to help, go back to nursing school. Because you'll get a better education than an MD in four years. They're dying for nurses, so you're going to get subsidized. Right now in America, we need 120,000 nurses we can't find. So you'll be paid for it. And if you have half a brain, by the way, which he did, he already had a, a lot of background education. I said, in two and a half years, you'll have a four-year degree. So he did it. Now he works with us. And I can't think of anyone better. He's a lot better than me. He sits in the room with people with catastrophic disease, looks them in the eye and says, hey, I reverse stage four cancer. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? My favorite couple that has come to us in a long time, totally blind and totally in love, Adam and Denise. All he does is kiss her. All he does is kiss her and hug her. They got so excited, their diabetes went away. They had so many problems, we couldn't even list them. You know, we had to have an extra page to list their problems in it. So they reversed most of their problems, and they said, oh, we want to be health educators. And we said, isn't that wonderful that for the first time in our history of the health educator program, we have people all over the world now that are health educators. We're going to have blind people. And they said, when we get out of this program, when we graduate, we want to teach the blind community about living food. Some of the top students we ever had. God bless these people. Again, prostate cancer, it's so damn easy, like, you know, you sneeze and that goes away. But you've got to like yourself. enough. This woman had for 30-some years this adenoma. One year after she came to us. My favorite thing we do is infertility now. Not that I'm involved. <laughs> but infertility, infertility is fun, you know. After a while, when you see tens of thousands of people recover from these catastrophic diseases, you sort of get bored. Matter of fact, I get angry at people if they don't get well. That means one thing to me. They loathe their life, period. Don't make it, oh, it's hard to do. Yeah, it's hard to die, too. Hard to suffer. Hard to do a lot of things. Not hard to live. But if you loathe yourself, it's hard to live. How many of you get that one? Hard to live if you loathe yourself. So we started to realize that we had something at Hippocrates that was unique that these couples would come to and say, I've been trying to have a baby for five years. I said, isn't it fun? <laughs> come on. I know it's late. <laughs> some 10 years, some 15 years we went to the infertility clinic. You haven't gotten cancer yet? Thank God. And they come and then they pop babies out left and right. As a matter of fact, back when we, before we had Wigmore Hall where we have our eating facility now, we used to have dozens of pictures of babies that people never could have until they got on the program. So why? Because this adjusts the H word. We talked about it last night. You get the hope. 
The first one is what? The hormones. So this brings you back to normality. Greatest story we have in this one, about 20 years ago, this wonderful lady that looks about 30 years younger than she is, calls us up. I know her two children at that point that were in their 30s. She said, I moved to Portland and I fell in love with a man 20 years younger than me. And I said, well, thank God, because a man her age couldn't keep up with her. And she's real sexy and really smart and really successful, didn't need money, you know, was, had nothing to do with that. And she said, but, you know, I want to have my tubes on tied and I want to have a baby. Now, we're optimists, but we're not outright liars. So she brings her young husband and they just really like him. When they're still together, I see them when we're out in Oregon uh, about once or twice a year. And Anna Marie and I said, well, we're not sure. You know, we've never seen somebody take their tubes, open them up again, and basically have a baby. Well, she had three miscarriages and finally had a baby at 52 years old. And, you know, I, sometimes I get real sentimental. And she stood up in graduation. Every Friday night, as many of you know, we honor the guests who are at Hippocrates. We give a formal graduation because we know how incredibly... Uh, courageous you are to come to a place like Hippocrates and make a decision to change. This is not small stuff. And she stood up and she had all of us crying. You know, she said, I came here years ago because I wanted to improve my life and now what's happened is I was given the gift of life from doing this. And that's what we can get. And we can become walking, talking, living examples of what others are capable of. And we can show that pain and suffering and demise and Negativity are not the norm. The homeostasis of humanity is joy and prosperity and happiness and health and healing. Cindy, great story. Three years ago, the day before she left, she came in in my office and said, I can't do this. I'm an American girl. I've never eaten any of this in my life. I like French fries. I like hamburgers. I like soda. I just can't do this. I said, do you realize that you have a very severe melanoma, stage four? She said, oh yeah, my doctor, I have the third most a renowned doctor in America, an oncologist, he's told me that. And he told me I'm going to die, but I, I'm an American girl. I don't think I can do this. So I hugged her and kissed her and never thought I'd see her again. And she went back home and something happened. And I was speaking about seven, eight months after that. And she was in the front row and she was a pretty quiet woman. She kept pulling me on the thing, and she said, I want to talk, and I want to talk. I said, what the heck she want to talk about? So I said, okay, please get up and talk. And she said, you know, yesterday the doctors told me that I no longer have melanoma. So I couldn't say anything. I had to continue the lecture, and then after the lecture, I couldn't wait to grab her and take her outside and say, what happened? And she said, well, I went home, and I looked in the eyes of my husband. I realized I couldn't die. And I looked at my children, and I realized they couldn't die. I looked in the mirror and said, what a joke it is. I'm ready to die. And she said, I did this 100%. And she said, I was so embarrassed because of what I said to you before I left, I never bothered to tell you. And I said, I don't care if you ever talk to me again in your life. If you heal, that's all that matters. And this is what you are capable of once you face what's really occurring. But until you see what's really occurring, you're not going to act. If you're going to be punched, the first thing you know how to do is protect yourself. If you don't know you're going to be punched, you're going to be hurt. You follow that? So protect yourself from you. You don't have to protect yourself from anything else. You have to protect yourself from you. And the lack of awareness that you've manufactured during a life of fear. That's really it. We stand at a crossword that will determine our individual and collective fate, shaping humanity's future. Life begets life, and there is no doubt that you will gain the energy, initiative, and awareness to become a participatory member of our rediscovered humanity. So give yourself a giant hand and join the club there. <laughs>